I mean, couldn't have been all bad, right? Hey folks, now my normal uh, tradition this time of year is to do uh, three lists. Uh, one for the 10 best movies of the year just passed, and then two videos for the year upcoming about movies that I am most excited for or that I'm pretty sure will suck. I'm kind of scrapping the last two completely because even though I, while I doubt the release schedule is going to see as much upheaval as 2020 did, I just don't trust it right now and you know that that's just annoying uh so until i have more security in that i'm not going to do a lot of things about the year coming up i'm just going to deal with it as it comes as a far and as far as looking back to 2020 goes uh, i am going to do that but i am not going to restrict myself to movies or theatrically released films uh which is what i normally do i'm not doing that this time because honestly there weren't a lot and while i there are certainly plenty of ones that i'm sure are good that i missed i decided to broaden the category out into just any form of entertainment that was released in 2020 i i actually should just say movies or tv because like that implies video games and while i did start playing some video games again they're all like really old because i have a ps3 anyways so i've expanded it out it's still going to be a top 10 list hey there folks it's me from the slight future quick interjection um right after shooting this video i actually ended up watching something that was made in 2020 and really ended up enjoying it and i am now adding it to the video and I didn't really want to bounce any of the stuff that I had already on here, so now this is a top 11. Be be because it is. All right, let's go! Number 11, Hamilton. This one, I'm sure there are plenty of other people out there who would put this one much, much, much higher. And while I actually did like it a lot, I'm finally getting to see it once I got Disney+. Plus. There are things about it like there's a lot of legitimate criticisms about this especially if you're going to tackle the way that it treats history and i'm not just talking about whether or not certain things are historically accurate there's just aspects to it and the way that certain characters are depicted that i don't always completely roll with but you know what the performances are great the music's awesome i really am impressed with some of the way these performances are are done they captured it actually very well staged shows being done as movies often oftentimes just end up being very boring this wasn't this was a really well put together presentation of a very good show and i liked it a lot i was late to the hamilton love train because you know i never bought the soundtrack and i definitely never saw it on stage but uh happy to be here now number 10 birds of prey or the fantabulous emancipation of one harley quinn Bet you forgot about this one, didn't you? Or if you remembered it, you were like, that was 2020? Yeah, it was. Pretty sure this was the last film I saw in theaters that year. And actually remains, to this point, the last movie I saw in theaters. We'll see what eventually breaks that streak once it's safe for me to actually start going to the theaters again. But I had a lot of fun with this movie. It is so much better at depicting not only the character of Harley Quinn, but of making good use of Margot Robbie's interpretation of the character. It lets her set the tone for the whole movie. I think that's part of the problem with her use in Suicide Squad. I mean, there's a lot of problems with Suicide Squad. But with her particularly, if you're going to have Harley Quinn, you kind of have to let her as a character set the tone. Otherwise, she feels out of place or underused here she gets to dictate how this thing feels how this thing looks it's colorful it's fast it's funny i like the performances i like most of the alterations done to the characters i find them to be inventive and enjoyable i don't really know why they call that one character cassandra kane because like that's not cassandra kane at all but still a good performance and and also honestly really underrated villain as well this was a good time Number nine, The Haunting of Bly Manor. Uh, 
Now, as a reminder, I have not yet watched all of Haunting of Hill House. I am actually trying to go back and redo it, but I'm taking it A, slowly, and two, with a uh, with a spotter. I'm watching it with somebody else there so that I can basically have someone to decompress with, because that was part of why I couldn't get through more than that. But without the baggage of Haunting of Hill House, I feel like I actually got more enjoyment out of Haunting of Blind Manor than it seemed a lot of other people did because of the need to compare it to Haunting of Hill House, which isn't necessarily an unfair thing to do. It is a spiritual sequel. You're allowed to compare them, but I didn't have that baggage. And I found a lot to enjoy about this, a lot that I found really interesting about the way that it depicted the ghosts and the motivations behind them and the way it got me to just skin crawlingly hate a certain character like I don't remember the last time that I've hated a character that much where it didn't feel like a mistake usually if I hate a character and I'm not going to name them out of the interest of spoilers but normally when I hate a character that much it's because something went like I don't want them in the story like I hate their presence This character absolutely belonged there, and I hated his guts. This was, this was really good. Like, I've got a couple of nitpicks on it uh, in terms of its resolution towards the end, but I really, I really like this a lot. And also, myself not being British, the accents didn't bug me, so that probably helped too. Number eight, Hannah Gadsby Douglas. Now, I thought Nanette was brilliant. Did a whole video about how brilliant I thought that show was. No matter what you thought of that show, the kind of statement that it was making and the kind of thing that it was, that is a really hard thing to pick up from and try and do a follow-up to. And yet I think Hannah Gadsby gives the perfect follow-up to Nanette. Not trying to recreate it, addressing what Nanette was, what it meant for her to do it, the fallout from it, but also not having that be the entire basis of the show either. Finding new ways to tackle things, finding new elements and new angles, and giving me, as someone who is not on the autism spectrum, I feel like a decent insight into what that kind of experience is like. I mean, I, I can't say that I understand. I never can. That's not how my brain works. But I feel like I was let in in a way that other media that has depicted autism in some way has always felt like it held me at an arm's length. She brought me in. It made me understand. In a way that in the net, she brought me in and made me understand her pain. So I think it's a terrific follow-up. It is very, very funny. And I'm not going to recommend it to people who hated Nanette. If you hated Nanette, just just don't bother. But if you thought there was good there, if you enjoyed Nanette, especially if you loved Nanette and you haven't seen Douglas yet, you need to. Number seven, Umbrella Academy Season 2. This is a bit of a surprise inclusion for me because I, I didn't dislike Season 1 all that much, but it didn't do much for me. I just watched it and I'm like, yeah, okay, that was a, that was a thing. All right, season two was my jam. Again, whole video on that one and how I was able to really tune into this thing's wavelength this time. It brought in the weirdness that I needed it to have because while the first one had its elements of weirdness, it was a little too dark. It took itself a little too seriously. This one still has serious moments and is able to have strong emotional payoff, but this one has a much better understanding that it is ridiculous on its face and most of these characters are absurd and it revels in it in a way that i am so excited about and i really really enjoyed from almost the instant it started this to me was such an upgrade from the first season it was a great time number six the owl house season one talked about that one recently over in the break room of geeks this is this is a really really good show. And I I will default to what I said there. This is Harry Potter by way of Gravity Falls. It has that vibe of exploring a world of magic and of learning about it and being coming more integrated into that world with a much higher degree of just weird And I'm so here for all of it. The characters are great. The lead character is not the kind of blank slate you usually get in a lot of stories like this. Luce has her own sense of personality, her own needs and wants and desires. She is interesting in and of herself. And then you put her in a setting that is this interesting. And you definitely have my attention 
from the start, I had a lot of fun with this, and I'm really, really anticipating where they go with this in future seasons. Number five. Wolf Walkers. I never did get around to reviewing, reviewing this one by itself, but partly because I don't have that much to say about it other than to say, uh, go watch it. It's really, 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 really good. It's gorgeous for starters. And I knew that going in. Like, I know this animation studio. I'm, I've been a fan of their work for a while. But it's stunningly beautiful, wonderful characters, real heart at its core. And, and here's the thing. You can see it for free. It is on Apple TV, and if you are not currently subscribed to that service, you can get a one-week free trial. Get on there, watch it, and watch whatever else that's on the service that you want to watch while you're there. Cancel your subscription before the week is over. You will not pay a cent. You will still see it. Nobody has any excuse for not seeing this movie. It is wonderful, gorgeous, uplifting, just terrific. Number four disclosure. I'm not a documentary person. I have a tendency to get either bored or frustrated with them for the most part. A lot of them have a tendency to not delve into the stuff that I actually find interesting. They brush by certain things or they um, they try to or they try to incorporate too much and don't have proper focus. I just don't have a lot of time for documentaries. Disclosure really nailed what it was going for. I was honestly nervous watching it because a lot of times when I have watched, be it video essays or documentaries or what have you, on LGBTQ+, plus, or in this case specifically transgender inclusion and history and places in the media, I've come away disappointed for one reason or another. But this made, first of all, the brilliant decision that every single person whose voice we hear and whose face we see is themselves transgender. It feels truly like trans people telling their own stories, their stories of self-discovery, their stories of seeing themselves in media or failing to see themselves in media and what that feels like, because that is something I absolutely relate to and I could connect with and understand not only seeing my experience reflected back at me accurately by the people who they spoke with and the way in which the whole thing is presented, but also giving me insight into people whose experiences are not dissimilar from mine, but are still distinctly different. This is a wonderful documentary. Even if you yourself are trans or you think you are really up to date and like well-versed in trans issues and you haven't watched it yet, you should. And if you don't know a lot of trans people and you yourself aren't trans, you absolutely should watch it because maybe it'll give you a better sense of what it's like for us in the fairly narrow category of seeing ourselves depicted on a screen. It's the kind of focus that I need from a documentary. It was the perfect focus for this one. Go watch it if you haven't. A quick shout out for some honorable mentions. Now, these are ones that didn't quite make the list, but were in contention. And those include The Old Guard, which was definitely way better than it had any right to be. Ultimately, it's not the kind of thing that I'm going to come back to often enough that I felt it really had a place on the list proper, but had a lot of really neat ideas, and Charlize Theron kicking butt is always a good thing. Castlevania Season 3, not quite up to the standards of Season 2, but still a surprisingly good follow-up. I wasn't sure that it could carry on from Season 2, but it did, and it was good and creepy, and I like it. Onward. I have a lot of world-building nitpicks with this, but the actual emotional core of the story is really, really solid. The relationships between the characters and the way that it ultimately pays off the familial story that it's telling is really, really well done. Bill and Ted face the music. This one was honestly never in that serious a contention for a place on the list proper, but I think it was a really heartfelt and sweet follow-up to a series that I didn't think it would be a good idea to come back and revisit. But it managed to do that all the same. I like the conclusion. I had a lot of fun seeing these characters again. It was just a good time. And finally, something that technically is would not qualify for the list because it didn't come into existence this year, but uh, shout out to Among Us. I know I kind of said that I don't really play modern video games anymore, but I did, I did get into that one a little bit. And you know what? It's a good way to unwind. It's a fun time. And who knew... That us all being stuck 
<laughs> in places and feeling like there was something that was being passed among us that was going to wipe us all out would somehow be in the zeitgeist all of a sudden. Huh. Don't know why that happened, but it's a good time. It's a fun game. I played the mobile version for a while. I did eventually get the PC version where I've now actually like played it proper, not just in a random public match, but like with an arranged thing with other people. Oh, it gets better when you play it that way. Game of the year 2020. I don't care what year it came out. Okay, back to the list proper. Number three... Hey, it's me again, which means this is where I get to jump in and talk about the thing that I watched after having shot the video originally. I watched Soul on Disney+. Plus. I didn't think this was going to be on my list. I don't hold Pixar in quite the same level of esteem that a lot of people do. I like Pixar, don't get me wrong, but more often than not, I like their stuff, but I don't love their stuff. And I will freely admit that part of why I liked Soul as much as I did might have had to do with the fact that I watched it when I wasn't really in a great mood. Uh, after I had shot the original version of this video, I, I had a I had a rough day, and some of that may have contributed to how much I liked this. There should be a full review up in the break room by now, but. Long story short, I found this heartfelt and touching, and it hit me in the best way. It really nailed the emotions that it went for in terms of finding joy in just living. Especially after a year like 2020, that was something I was really happy to see delivered so well. If you haven't seen it yet, you really should. Number two, The Good Place, season four. It is so hard to end well. I mean, we've seen in the last few years how many things have botched their endings, from Game of Thrones to Star Wars. It's really hard hard to nail the landing but good place absolutely did it took this idea and these characters that are funny and entertaining but philosophical existential even and found a way to bring it all to a satisfying conclusion this was something like i don't know how they can possibly end this this is the perfect way to end this again did a whole video on it. The way that everything wraps up, the way the characters are are sent off, and the way that things conclude in terms of a feel. That something can have a sense of finality while still feeling, yeah, that is wonderful. And that was absolutely something I needed this year. And I think a lot of us did. Doesn't quite take the number one spot. It's possible that The Good Place Season 4 is the best written and most impressive piece of work, you know, from a, a construction standpoint and everything else, but it didn't hit me quite the same as number one, she and the Princesses of Power Season 5. I love almost everything about this. I'm not going to say that I have absolutely no nitpicks. I had a couple when I did my review, but like I did multiple videos on this for a reason cuz I love these characters. I love the sense of friendship and hope and struggle and triumph of this show. It has characters that I hold dear to my core. It was one of the main things I got to, you know, have to do with my daughter for a while. The queerness of it and the explicit demonstration of non-heterosexual romantic love between the leads at the end was wonderful, but it was icing on a cake because I already loved this thing so 
much. I can't even begin to tell you how wonderful this thing was and how beautifully it managed to wrap up. She-Ra Season 5 is my favorite piece of entertainment that came out in 2020. What would be on your list? Whatever it is, feel free to include things like video games or only do a top five or heck, it's your list. Do however you want. Go ahead and drop it down in the comments. Let's talk about it. Of course, feel free to leave your comments on my list uh, as well. All of that uh, is very, very welcome. I have a Patreon. In 2020, I lost my job and this is now actually what I do for a living and it's because of the Patreon that I'm able to pay my bills. Any amount you are able to support keeps the lights on and keeps me fed. But even if you're not able to do that, liking, sharing, subscribing, all that helps as well. So I would greatly appreciate it, but you also don't have to. End of the day, you are the council, and I am just running the meetings. And until next time, this council is adjourned.